And welcome everyone. Um, I introduce myself first, to those who don't know. I'm Joanna Bornat. I'm a trustee of the Oral History Society and um, an editor of the journal Oral History. Um, and Juanita is doing the sort of support, the tech support, which I'm very, very grateful. Uh, she's turned her screen off, but she's very much there. Um, and this is, um, oh, I should say that we've been um, holding these events, these in dialogue events since last year. We had uh, three last year and we've got four this year. And we're the society, the Oral History Society is very, very grateful indeed for the Institute for Historical Research for supporting us, certainly on these, these two occasions this year. And the aim of the dialogues is for a mutual sharing of interest and experience in doing oral history, that is recording and researching the past through the memories of people who lived it. And this, this idea and the commitment to dialogue follows from the Oral History Society's determination to acquire greater awareness and appreciation of black and minority ethnic history involving critical reflection and greater inclusivity in terms of the society's organization, practice and publications. We feel it's really important for the society to be in dialogue, be in discussion, to be learning and to be developing our work. So we're delighted for this second 2023 event to be in di dialogue with Claudia McFarlane of the African Caribbean Achievement Project in Bradford. Um, ACAP was set up in 1995 as an education-based charity with the aim of promoting and raising the education and development of people of African and Caribbean descent with the aim of achieving racial justice and equality in education. ACAP's Windrush Three Generations, which I've got a copy of here, Stories of uh, Hope, Courage and Success, was published in 2022. And Claudia will be joined, she will be speaking first, she'll be joined by Claude Hendrickson, who's a community leader and project director based in Leeds. And he'll be talking about his work with boys and young men, focusing on projects such as the race card toolkit and capacity building around awareness of community history. Claudia and Claude will be in discussion with Heather Norris, Nicholson, who's also a member of the Oral History Society, uh, Society journal editorial team and an independent writer and researcher. Her interest in archival un underrepresentation, memory and identity have contributed to recent oral history related projects with West Yorkshire's African Caribbean descent communities. With contributions from the audience, we expect the dialogue to last an hour and a half. Uh, just to let you know, which you will know, because as you came in, you will have seen it, that the, the event is being recorded so that we're hoping others who haven't managed to be here tonight um, will be able to see it. So um, I won't, I think, carry on any longer, but um, open the floor to you, Claudia, to, in, to begin. Um, you're going to be, both Claudia and Claude will have PowerPoints, and uh, I think that's what you'll be doing now, loading it up. Yeah. I'll just get I'll just one second to just get it up. Yeah. Have um you given me screen sharing? Yes, you've got co-hosting permissions. Lovely. So can you guys see my screen? Because some You've got to share the screen with me. Oh, I'll give me screen sharing permissions. Yeah, so you've currently got screen sharing permissions. So all you need to do is go into the green button at the bottom, um, which says screen share. Um, unless, yeah, and you basically just upload it from there. But if you if you want me to upload it, I can also do that. No, just give us one sec, because as I say, this my presentation's got the timings on it. Right, okay. Oh, just to say to people, do um, keep looking at the chat because there will be information there that you might want to copy at the moment, it's telling you how to become a member of the Oral History Society. Ah, oh, here we go. So can you see my screen now? Yeah, we can yes, see the yes. screen. Yeah. Thank you very much, yeah. That's brilliant. I've just got one more thing to do. Can you still see the PowerPoint? Yeah. And just the see, PowerPoint. See slide two. 
Okay. Is that better? That's your title slide. Okay, I'll, I'll make a start there then. That's no problem. Just got this visual aid here. Sorry, audience. Don't worry, Claudia. Um, just take your time. It's always fiddly with these um, uploading uh, PowerPoints, so don't worry. We're on your side. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It doesn't help that I can't see very well at the moment. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm ready to go. Good. <laughs> Okay, okay. Right. First of all, thank you very much for hosting us, ACAP, a small little charity in Bradford, West Yorkshire. Um, you know, we've been in the game quite a, a few years, as you'll see as I go forward with the presentation. But ACAP, which is the African Caribbean Achievement Project, um, as was mentioned before, you see my power, it's not working. The... Sorry. There we go. There we are. <clears throat> As was mentioned in the intro, it was established in 1995, really. We're a grassroots charity, really small, but we pack a big punch, really, if you like. Um, the whole mission and why we started in the first place was to advance the education and welfare of African Caribbean people in West Yorkshire. And if you go back to the 90s, it was a time when, you know, things weren't like they are today. There were a lot of stressors on the community. And even though there are now, it was amplified back then because there was simply no services, which I'll go on to discuss. So since we started really, our whole fight has been um, for racial justice and equality in education. And all the programs that we do, they've got an education focus. Yes. Sorry? Oh, they've got an education focus and also they are pinned, underpinned really, by this right to a fair access to education. I'll introduce myself again. My name is Claudia McFarlane and I am the director of ACAP. That picture there is just a typical picture, a typical one of our sessions really. I think that was a science session. And we, as you go on to see in the slides, we offer a lot of um, educational activities to young people. But before I really go on to speak about ACAP, I want to, talk about the context in which ACAP came about in the first place, because really we're all children of the Windrush generation. And I wanted to mention that and acknowledge the contributions that um, the former generations have made for us. You know, we are privileged enough to uh, be able to work in a charity like ACAP because of, you know, the generation that were brave enough to come here in the first place. And when I talk about the Windrush generation, I'm talking about the people that came here between 1948 and 1971 as part of what we call the Windrush generation. Now, the majority of them came from the Caribbean, as we all know, but they were also, um, you know, people that came from Africa at the time, and they're often excluded from the Windrush discussions. So I wanted to mention that as well, that yes, it's about the Caribbean, but there was lots of Africans that also made that migration um, journey between 1948 and 1971. And they came over here really as invited guests by the British government who, wanted the, who needed their help to come and build the country back up after the damage, damaging devastation of World War II. So if we look at the struggles and discrimination that they faced, this was in all the different sectors from um, the NHS and healthcare, transport services, and a lot of the public um, sector services that 
they came over here to fill. They had a terrible time, most of them. And I'm saying that because I am what you call a first, second generation, if you like. Um, and I know the stories of my parents and their peers and what they had to go through to put us in a position that we're in today. It's, you know, definitely worth um, mentioning and celebrating. So despite all the struggles and discrimination that they faced in the workplace, in employment, in education, you know, they still um, managed to continue and show great resilience. I have to keep moving forward to see what, what's on the slide. The legacy of resilience and activism in Bradford. We come from a really rich history and culture of fighting for our rights really in Bradford. And that's what I wanted to mention. There's lots of groups that have come before ACAP that you know really paved the way for an organization like this to exist in the first place. You know, we've had our fair share of, you know, fighting for justice in the education system, um, ensuring that our children have fair access to the best schools that they were previously excluded from, you know, just fighting um, school exclusions amongst African Caribbean um, young people, period, and all the other things that we have to do to just, you know, get educated in this country. Um, so when you look at the resistance and the fighting and everything that was happening for the Windrush generation, you can see how it was easy for an, um, an organization like ACAP uh, to come to the fore. So that's how we were developed. It was on the back of parents who were really upset with the um, rate of exclusions of their children in school, particularly boys, and also just the substandard education that a lot of the children were receiving at the time. So a group of parents got together to, to start this um, voluntary sector group at the time that became a charity um, in 95. And, you know, the mission was at that time to go into schools, work with our children, to really raise what we call self-esteem and racial esteem, and to ensure that teachers understood how to work with our children and how to you know get the best out of them so we developed lots and lots of programs which I'll go on to speak about now I was told to mention how social activism um, impacted our work and so I'm going to explain that now through the programs that we currently provide we we provide um, different projects and services across education and health and well-being categories as, as well as a very big volunteering program. So I'm just gonna sp speak about this. I'm not gonna labor it too long because I'm conscious of time as well. I don't wanna go over. So this is what we currently provide. Mentoring services, which is really the bread and butter of ACAP. We go into schools and mentor children. And we also mentor in the community and from our community center. We mentor one-to-one -one and in small groups. Online tutoring in maths and science, advocacy and support for parents, STEM um, and science clubs. We run monthly um, STEM clubs and science clubs. And out of school um, and summer activities, you know, like the general play scheme sort of thing. We also run programs on financial literacy and IT upskilling and employability type schemes. When it comes to health and well-being, I'm going to bring them all up because the slide's gone a bit funny. But we've got therapeutic arts and crafts um, projects, which sees us working with groups of predominantly women, to be fair, but we do get men as well. Uh, that come in to do arts and crafts as a, as a form of therapy, uh, particularly in the um, environment that we're living in now with the cost of living crisis, it's really hitting the community hard. And prior to that COVID and how that all just mashed up the community in many ways, uh, we developed a, a series of um, 
workshops around therapy and using the arts to heal. So that's a, a really good project that we do. We've got the Active Women Together project, which is a project that encourages women to become more active because of the high levels of obesity and um, just lack of activity amongst women, believe it or not, in Bradford. So we developed a project to combat that. Um, Women Cycling Club, that's been going for about seven or eight years now. And that's just a weekly cycling club for women that, you know, want to go out, uh, form new friendships, you know, just take part in uh, nature, really, and take advantage of all the roads that have been built for cyclists. Um, the men's group and the counselling service, again, which was a, a result of COVID, actually, uh, our people needed counselling, so we developed a service around that, where professional counsellors offer counselling therapy to people in the community that need it. And the Wellbeing Cafe, although it's not open at the moment, we do have a large kitchen at our premises in Bradford, and we, up until recently, um, ran a Wellbeing Cafe that encouraged people to come in and, as well as get a really nice, healthy food, you know, have access to counsellors and mindfulness practitioners and all kinds of good stuff as, as a way of introducing the community to it, but not forcing it down their throats. And as I said at the beginning, you know, ACAP is a volunteer charity. You know, it was started by volunteers and it's still run by volunteers. Um, and it's a big part of what we do. We really believe in, you know, community action and, you know, doing for ourselves. So when it comes to volunteering, this is where I, I really believe that social um, activism uh, comes in. Um, community activism, that is achieved through volunteering in the way that we, you know, involve the community, um, introduce them to our programs and then encourage them to take forward the issues that are important to them. What this does is it builds capacity and resilience in the community because the more skilled they are, the more knowledgeable they are about the issues that affect them, then that definitely, you know, inspires them to become um, connected and, you know, more active in the community. That leads to better projects and services and that leads to, that leads to better outcomes for um, the community as a whole. And collective ownership and action. Sorry, I have to keep doing that to see it. But yeah, collective con uh, ownership and action, obviously by involving people in the way that we do, it does lead to a sense of ownership and collectivity which enhances the success of all the projects that we do and all the services that we run. We're a people-led organization. And finally, what we're working towards is creating lasting change in the community and just ensuring a situation where, you know, our needs as a community are met and in particular, social, political and economic needs, our educational needs, housing needs. There's just so many. But through our projects, we tackle quite a few of the social issues. I'm going to move on to oral history now because it's obvious that we have been invited by the Oral History Society. And as well as all the projects that I spoke about just a moment ago, uh, we've got a really successful oral history project. And I wanted to talk about why we did it in the first place. We wanted to uh, run an oral history project because we believe that knowledge, in, knowledge is power. And by the gathering of the information around our community, we think it's crucial. It's crucial because we are an overlooked people with an overlooked history. We've been excluded from a lot of the textbooks and we are underrepresented in history, period. Um, we're also, um, underrepresented in, main, in mainstream institutions, most of them, including the Oral History Society. And I'm glad that you actually acknowledge that and that you, are, you actually invite groups like us to come in and speak, because I think it's important. Also, by taking part in oral history projects, we believe that it's a preservation of, of our own narrative. It's our story instead of his story. You know, we can 
uh, collect um, data and information off people that can be preserved for, for you know, future generations and everything like that. I spoke briefly about the capacity building benefits of um, oral history projects in that all the different moving parts from the researchers to the interviewers, the, the people that are taking part, volunteers, the organizers, everybody gets a chance to um, develop their skills and uplift themselves really um, through IT, through uh, uh, various um, training programs that we send them on or that we deliver in house. And so there's this whole effort that whilst we're doing this project, there, there is an emphasis on everybody sort of raising their capacity a little bit. A big part of it is collaboration and partnerships. And that's why I'm glad Claude's here today because he is one of our partners. And often when we work on projects, um, we work right across West Yorkshire. Uh, Claude's from Leeds, I'm from Bradford, and we've, we've also got partners in Huddersfield that we work with as well. And we don't exclude the little small towns like your Halifaxes and your Wakefields because we've got people in those areas as well that benefit from our projects and services. So it's really important to us its oral history. So I'll speak now about one of the projects that we have recently done. Um, and this is our um, oral history project that led to the book that has been displayed earlier. And I'm going to talk about how we did it. Uh, it was face-to-face -face interviews uh, style for every participant. We um, and we wanted it to be intergenerational. So we let the young people lead it and they came up with all the questions and everything that we asked uh, three different generations of people. It was a organic process in the sense that we used the uh, every interviewee, inter interviewee, sorry, to choose the next person. So we didn't want to show any bias by selecting the people we wanted. They chose the people. And as I said, it was three generations and it, it produced huge impact in the community. And there was a lot of buzz and hysteria actually around it, especially when the book came out, it was celebrated very well. So, this is how we're preserving it really. This is how we, our way of preserving oral history because we do believe, you know, that it is important. You know, we're capturing their stories, the, the stories so that future generations and everybody else can benefit. And by that, you know, we mean archiving. Um, the black community, you know, were integral actually to the oral history and story of, of Britain and British history period. There's some, so much that has not come out about our contributions, but because of the work of organizations like ACA, you know, and others, of course, you know, things are coming out and this history is beginning to be unearthed. Really, um, that's the oral history project. I'll show you in a little while um, what the book looks like, but, I wanted to just briefly speak about some of the other ACAP oral history projects that we have taken part in recently. We've got the um, sound system project, which saw was saw Claude actually as one of our ambassadors, uh, go around the country and interview founding members of sound systems. Now, for those that don't know, sound systems played a big part in our um, history and especially in raising the political consciousness of the community, because they did that through music. And so sound system is really important in our community. So we wanted to definitely do something that documented their history. So we run a large and, and successful project for two straight years actually on sound systems and their founding um, principles and stuff like that. We spoke to lots and lots of people. By the way, everything that I'm speaking about is on our YouTube channel, so people can go and have a look at all the interviews and stuff like that. We introduced the Windrush Awards, actually, to West Yorkshire, which, again, 
was meant to be a celebration and commemoration of the contributions that African Caribbean people have made um, to the UK and to West Yorkshire in particular, because there's always a focus on London and Birmingham and the bigger towns. We wanted to focus on, um, you know, Bradford, because, not Bradford, sorry, West Yorkshire, because, you know, we're a marginalised community in terms of, you know, resources and access to um, libraries and everything. So we wanted to, you know, um, do our own thing, celebrate people who had made massive contributions to West Yorkshire life and unearth some of the struggles and stories that they had so that we could preserve this um, history in the form of a book. So we had the Windrush Awards, sorry. There was lots and lots of different categories. I think we had 11 categories, everything from the Legacy Award, which celebrated people that had worked tirelessly in the community for years and years, right um, down or through to um, young people who had achieved outstanding success. And another big um, oral history project and how we are archiving and documenting our history is through our Flavours of the Caribbean cooking um, showcase, which saw us interview lots of different chefs from all the different Caribbean islands who came into our kitchen and cooked their national dish whilst we interviewed them about their migration story and about their life in England and, you know, just their experiences general, generally, their lived experiences and their personal contributions you know, to, to the UK. So that was a hugely successful oral history project of ours. We also do lots and lots of black history lectures and courses, again, with the aim of cementing our history and, you know, making pathways and routes for our stories to be passed down, especially to our young people. Conscious of time, so I, I'm gonna move on. This is the book that I was referring to when we was collecting the data for our oral history project. This is a Windows Three Generations book that interviews the first generation that came out and the two generations that came after. Shameless plug that it is available on Amazon for those that want to go and buy it and support the charity. That would be fantastic. And I'll move on now to the summary really which was, you know, we're an organization and a charity, you know, we've been around for a long time. We're still very committed to um, delivering good quality supplementary education, health and social wellbeing programs. And we are deeply committed to our work um, within the oral history field as well. And always excited to take part in projects and our young people are always involved in some type of activity you know when it comes to this whole subject i will say that our history is very important and oral history is very important to us at ACA. um oral history and community ac activism actually going hand in hand as far as i'm concerned because through the projects that we involve people with and the involvement that they have and the capacity that they build and the you know community action that they want to take after that it all leads to bigger and better outcomes for the community as a whole and uh, we've shown that you know through the various oral history projects that we delivered that there's a variety of ways to capture and preserve our you know stories and preserve our heritage so that, you know, future generations and existing generations, you know, can benefit from some of the knowledge and wisdom that our people have. You know, we've made enormous contributions to this country. And that is really what drives a lot of our programs, knowing that and knowing that there's nobody singing and dancing about it. And that's why we decided to do it from our small little town in Bradford. And that is it. I have been Claudia McFarlane and this is our cat. Thank you.
Well, thanks so much, Claudia. That was a tremendous uh, overview. And uh, I'm sure you had to, you know, cram uh, a lot into that short space of time. So if anybody wants to, you know, pick up now with you, any of those points you make and, and later on after the uh, after tonight, I'm sure they'll want to and they've got some good leads there. Um, really, you know, personally, I feel really impressed to, to read about your whole approach. I like and I like that where you talk about a variety of ways to capture um, the past. I think that's very inspiring and creative. So thank you so much, Claudia. Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> we're now going to move on to Claude, I hope. Um, I hope that Juanita's somewhere in the background sorting us I, out. I, I am. I just need to wait for um, Claudia to take her screen down. Oh, and... sorry. What? How do I do that, Juanita? Um, if you... Um, gosh, I think you just go into... Oh, let me make myself um, um hold on i think that's how I'd... you should be able to yeah i think i'm gonna there. there you go i think i've swapped it now brilliant Okay, um, I can see there's some uh, a question in the chat already, but if we can save that for when we, uh, when Claude's finished, uh, a cert, uh, an interesting question about oral history's role in um, recording the history of ACAP itself. Um, yeah. But now, but now Claude, it's up to you. It's over to you now um, to take over. Yes. Good evening. Hello there. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> um, has she got it on slide and or, or, or she got on at the side by side? I can't. Oh, I, got... I see. Okay. Yes. Hold on a second. I wasn't. I wasn't sure what you could see. Um. Yeah. It's slideshow up at the top in the middle. We've, slideshow. We've got your title slide. Yeah. Yeah, hold on a second. I'm just going to move something out of the way so I can see it properly. I've got the... um. Okay. I think the problem is I've got a split screen. Um, I'm not sure how that works. Hold on. Is it view and then present a view? Mm. Hang on. View. Oops. From the beginning. All right, let me just start again. If anybody can, oh, right, here we go, oh, right. Okay. All right. Is that me now? Everything cooking and going? Yes. I hope so. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you for the invitation, Joanna and Heather, um, to contribute to this um, oral history project. Um, I'm Claude Hendrickson from Chapel Town, Leeds. Actually, I'm coming to you from Barcelona today because I'm here in Barcelona on a um, housing, social housing conference. So bear with me because I'm in from Barcelona. Um, right, um, Claude Hendrickson, um, Community Development and Social Justice um, presentation. I'm, I'm part of the Leeds West Indian Centre Charitable Trust, which is based in Leeds. And what I'd like to say is a lot of what um, Claudia has spoke about um, has happened in different ways in most communities across the UK, um, but even more so in West Yorkshire. So slide two, please. I'm going to take you through um, a whistle stop talk because Claudia's had a big, she's done a big session. So, yeah, activism. 
I think all the communities across West Yorkshire and all the black people in the UK were um, encouraged over, and she spoke about the Windrush generation and the children born here in the UK. And I'm, of, I'm also one of the first generation of children born here. Uh, my mother came in 1958, I was born in 1960. So watching the activism and how the activism across West Yorkshire and across the nation was um, initiated, I would say. Um, and and when, when we talk about that, we have to talk about um, organizations that um, pushed activism, organizations like the Young Socialists, um, they were very active in Chapel Town back in the 60s, supporting our parents, because obviously, even though the black community was having it hard, it did find white allies within the system. Um, but there were things that were empowering the black community through the 60s, right? So, so I'm gonna give you, I'm not gonna go through them all, but groups like the Black Panthers, people like Malcolm X, um, people nationally like um, Darkest Howe. Um, in Leeds, we had situations where, and Claudia spoke about young people, and I'm gonna come back to that as well. Um, we had, um, the riots of 1975, which was very much about the police handling of the community, um, which also led on to the riots of 1981, which were more, and Claudia spoke about it, more about the, the underrepresentation and the no opportunities in employment, housing, education, training, health and well-being that we as a generation were suffering. Um, in Leeds, they formed an organization after the 81 riots called the Chapel Town and Herald's Liaison Committee, which was formed straight after the 81 riots, which was a platform for inter conversations between local authority and the young people and the community. Um, the Rasta movement, which I have to mention, um, when you talk about activism and how activism empowered the community. The Rasta movement, the 12 tribes of Israel and his Imperial Majesty, Haile Selassie, were beacons for empowering black people to kind of stand up and, 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 and um, take some responsibility for what was happening to them and fight back. And then in the later stages, we had people like Nelson Mandela and his incarceration, um, the 26 years that he spent in prison, which in Leeds, um, we have um, the Leeds Mandela Center, which is in respect of, of, of the Mandela saga. And, and out of the riots, we also ended up with the Leeds West Indian Center and the Mandela Center. So that I'm just giving you a whistle stop tour there of activism before I go in and, and where act and how activism was underpinned, especially in the Chapel Town community, but I think within many communities across the country. Next slide, please. Hello. Is that Sorry, a stop? I'm here. I'm just trying to get the next slide up. I don't know why it's not moving. Okay. Right. Um, go back a slide. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, right. Sorry about this, because obviously she's sharing my screen because I, I couldn't do it from across here. The internet's a bit down. But anyway, in just to give you a kind of flavor after all of that, um, in Chapel... We lost him. 
We have. Oh, gosh. Yeah, it sounds like his screen's probably frozen. Right. Oh, dear. Can he log on, log off? How are we going to contact him? He'll probably try and come back in. He will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure you're right. He must yes. know. Shall yeah. I WhatsApp him? Yeah, if you've got a number, but I think, I'm sure he'll he'll try and log back on. Yeah. Is he there again? He's moving again now. Is he? Uh, he's... Hi, Claude. We've lost your sound. He's, he's muted. Does he need to unmute? Mm. Hi there, Claude. Can you hear? We've lost your sound. You're shown as muted. Yeah, oh. I've got yeah, yeah, back, yeah. Back again, back again. Hooray, hooray. Trust me, trust me to have somebody phone me from England, eh? Um, <laughs> you're too, too popular there, we see too important <laughs> on this occasion. Right, right, okay. Here we go. Okay, that'll be that'll be my, my that's I think that's my Barcelona people um that are at this conference. Anyway, let me get back to where I was. So um after many years, oh Jesus. We can still hear you, Claude. No, no, I, I I know, I know, I know. I'm just checking. All right, you can hear me? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Just yeah. My look. Okay. So, like Claudia was saying, many communities were suffering under all of the issues that she highlighted. And in Leeds, back in 2012, we, at the Leeds West Indian Centre Charitable Trust, we set up a project called the Race Card Project, because what we'd realised is that whenever... Um, Black people wanted to talk about the issues that they were facing. They would always say that we were using the race card, which actually created a sense of negativity. So we wanted to change the narrative on the term race card. Um, when the black people talk about inequalities and issues they were facing. So what we, we set out to do was look at the West Yorkshire experience. And we looked at Leeds, Bradford, Huddersfield and Wakefield um, and, and the African Caribbean communities that were, um, that had not been catered for, as, as, as you heard Claudia mention on various things. And, and the topics we looked at across Leeds, Bradford and Huddersfield were organizations that had worked around policing of the community, media, education and employment, health and well-being, housing, and a feeling of belonging because a lot of the black people that were now had now settled in the UK for over 20, 30 years still did not have a sense of feeling like they belonged and they were treated equally within the system. So what we wanted to do with the race card project was look at how Bradford, Huddersfield, Wakefield and Leeds had tackled those issues that were similar right across the three to four areas. Um, so we went about interviewing organisations that had existed, some of them for over 20 years, some of them for 30 years, across Leeds, Bradford and Huddersfield. ACAP was one of the organisations we interviewed and what we wanted to look at was how they tackled the issues and were there any good practice they could share because we still felt that there were certain issues that were still going on so for example black boys were still the highest had a high exclusion rate um stop and search was very evident black boys were more likely to be stopped and searched so we, we wanted to see how they tackled them. And, and um, we did an extensive interview of nearly 40 organizations across West Yorkshire. 
Um, and there were certain things that came out within, within, within that research, um, issues that were barriers such as islandism, um, it was felt that um, the different islands, because even though um, all, all of the, the areas were black areas, they were made up of different dynamics. So for example, in Chapel Town, the biggest number of black people that had settled in Chapel Town were from St. Kitts and Nevis. And the second biggest denomination were from Jamaica. In Bradford, the biggest denomination of black people in Bradford was from um, Dominica. Dominica. Dom from, from Dominica. And the second biggest denomination were from Jamaica. In, in Huddersfield, the biggest denomination of Caribbean people that had settled there were from Grenada and Karakou. And the second biggest denomination were Jamaicans. So, and in Wakefield, they didn't have that many Caribbean people that settled in Wakefield, it was more African people. Um, but what, what, what we learned from that was across West Yorkshire, there was actually more Jamaicans, but in the individual cities, that wasn't the case. And um, due to that, there were issues, around, when I say islandism, that everybody thought because a lot of guys were in sound systems that everybody was Jamaican. And, and, and we did, you know, there was stuff that, that came out. Um, generation blocking was another barrier that we found. Um, the older generation were holding on to the reins of organizations for too long and not allowing the so-called youth of, of the day in the 80s to kind of come through. Um, what I would say is that, and we also learned from this research that sometimes community work is, is a very thankless task. It's very thankless. Individuals in our communities take on being the spearhead for change and actually suffer a lot. You know, we, we think about it like this, um, Black community activists suffer it two sides. They get it from the white institutionally racist organizations, but they also get it within their community. So it's a double whammy being an activist within the community. This is what the research was showing us. Um, institutional mistrust and undermining um, over the, over the decades, the institutions such as the local authority, the police, the education system have a big mistrust in what black people present to them. So when we present a way of, and, and Claudia spoke, maybe we find a way of dealing with our young boys that would stop them getting from in, excluded. The education system didn't want to engage, they didn't want us in their schools. And undermining, you know, I, I look at the youth service when, when black people were coming up with a better way of working with black youth than the statutory delivery. And I'll speak about that a little later on. Um, they would undermine it. They would, for example, take some of the best black workers, youth workers, and make them work for the local authority. And once they started working for the local authority, they couldn't deliver quality back to the community because they had to do what their paymasters said. Another outcome from the race card um, research was negative, negative media and, and the role that the media plays in promoting a negative narrative around black people. Mm -hmm. um, that, that was evident right across when we spoke with the Yorkshire Evening Post, when we spoke with the Huddersfield Examiner, when we spoke with the um, Bradford, um, what is it called? The Bradford... Telegraph and Argos. Yeah, um, it, was, it was very evident. Um, um, and also... <laughs> Institutional racism, which is a word the system doesn't like, but it's a fact. You know, we've had to deal with half of a century of this and people like me and Claudia 
uh, sat here now half a century after being born in the UK, still talking about the issues that we've had to face. Next slide, please. So yeah, so the race card project, like I said, we went round, we met with all these groups, we got their information and we created a document. And we launched, we launched the doc, we launched the research in, I think it was 2017, 18, 2017, where we had people like you can see a Simon Woolley come up. We had um, one of the police crime commissioners um come up we had people like um oh is that his name just gone from me and i can see him there we had um milton brown from cltv from huddersfield who was running a made a media organization we had heather nelson from bhi who was running a black health initiative and we had at Jeremy Crooks from London, who was an who had been actively running um, BTEG Black Training and Enterprise Group in London, tackling a lot of the issues you heard Claudia mention. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Sorry, I don't know why it keeps getting stuck. So yes, yeah, so um, the the race card project was very much about when you know whenever they said we were using the race card, and instead of it being having a negative narrative, we wanted to give it a positive narrative. Now here are some of the projects that we that have happened in Leeds. Um, to kind of change that narrative. We, um, there was a narrative that in the 80s that a, a, a defeating stereotype of black men being lazy, didn't want to work, wanted to sell drugs, didn't want to work in the construction industry. Um, but what we did, we set up a project where a group of unemployed men came together um, because when it came to housing, young men would always be the last to get housed because they would house women and children first. So it was very hard for young men to get decent housing. So the, um, I was involved in a project where a group of men got together and um, they built their own houses, 90,000 bricks, 54,000 blocks, 8,000 roof tiles. And that was very much to prove that a group of black men given the support could achieve absolutely ever anything. Because a lot of the time, a lot of the good work that is done in communities is not evident to be seen. But 25 years later, them houses are still there. Six of the guys are still living in them. Um, so again, that was one project. And they wanted to go on after that project and develop the um, frontline trust, which would allow local contractors to come together to hopefully access work from the local council and housing associations, which never really happened. Back to your institutional racism, back to your undermining. Even though they delivered a half a million pound building project, they still couldn't get work from the council and from housing associations. Next slide, please. Chapel Town Young People's Club was another, you, you, you heard um, Claudia talk about young people. Um, in Chapel Town, an organization was created called the Chapel Town Young People's Club, which was the voice of young people that was opened in 1992. Um, back then, we realized that the biggest, one of the biggest corrupter of young people especially in disadvantaged communities, were the six week summer holidays. Because if you were disadvantaged and didn't have no money, your parents didn't really have the option to do anything with you. So you spent a lot of time just hanging around the streets and doing, and doing what normal disadvantaged kids do, getting into trouble, which they call antisocial behavior. 
So we set up, um, or the Chapel Town Young People's Club was set up to run summer programmes during the summer to take them young people off of the streets and give them activities to do it. It was aimed at 14 to 16 year olds because we also found that a lot of work was done with homework clubs and summer and um, after school clubs with the younger under 11 year olds, but there wasn't enough work done around 14 to 16 year olds. So they created a homework club, especially for that age group because they were going through their stats. The last two years of their school life were very crucial to them. And, and young boys, like we mentioned before, were the ones that were not benefiting. So we ran homework clubs and um, we ran homework clubs and, and we had a rule that if you didn't come to the work homework club, you couldn't come to the youth club because we wanted them to understand ex education was as much important as play. Um, another organization that came out of the 10 to 2 club was the Yes Cyber project in 2000, where the young people had said that they felt that they felt like they're hidden. They felt like all of the youth provision were in hidden buildings. They were behind places and they wanted somewhere on the high street. They wanted young, young people not to be seen as antisocial, but seen as up front, being on the front, on the high street, engaging in education and training. So we, they came together and they set up the first internet community internet access point in the city of Leeds back in 2000. Um, they also went on to set up their own youth club, which was a group of 17, 18 year olds that were then, that ran a youth club for the 13 to um, 16 year olds called Project 7, a really good, working with their peers, it was a really good thing. All of this was closed down after in 2012 due to the austerity cuts of Leeds City Council. So Leeds City Council, when they were ready, they decided that the black projects should go first. So all of the black provisions in the city of Leeds were closed down. Next slide, please. Um, examples of feeling part of society. And I wanted this slide in because I thought it was important that when you talk about feeling part of it, it, it goes right back to school um, and racism. And, and I put racism and discourse. I put that because as, as young kids, we used to want to go to the school disco, but the school disco didn't play black music. And the racism we suffered from the school disco that, that then went into the little clubs that we went to around, around the city. Whereas, so we had to eventually form our own kind of special youth club for black children. Um, in, in Bradford, they had a project, um, a venue called Green Lane. And in, in Leeds, we used to use, again, there were schools, we would use schools so we could create safe places for black people to black children to go and play their music. Um, and then in Leeds, we're fortunate that in 1966, the first Caribbean carnival was started. Um, so in Leeds, we've had a carnival growing since 1967. Sound systems were um, a great feeling of creating safe spaces where black people could do because when you went to the discos in town you faced a lot of racism being chased by white guys beaten up by them so we created safe spaces so the sound systems had a really crucial role to play in creating um our generation feeling part of society and so it was a really a, a honor to be asked by ACAB to go and do the sound system, the Windrush sound system story, um, traveling around to some of the sound systems that had come and inspired young people in our community. Um, community radio, 
um, even to the day, we're still not hearing as much music on the radio for black people. Um, so co community radio was set up in Bradford. They had PCRL in Leeds. We had MCR, People's FM. So radio has been a crucial tool for making the black community feel part of society. In Leeds, we're fortunate that in 1987, we started the Leeds Reggae Concert, which has been going for nearly 30 years, which is part of the carnival, where we get something like 120,000 people coming to Chapel Town to enjoy black culture. Um, and it's not just for black people, it's for all people. Um, that's been going for over 50 years. The Bicentenary Project, um, which happened in 2007 to 2009, which was a project, and, and, and Claudia talked about celebrating our history and celebrating our involvement. Um, the Bicentenary Project was a project that was funded by the Heritage Lottery um, to celebrate, well, I don't know whether it really did celebrate, to celebrate 200 years since the abolition of the Slave Trade Act, um, a well-documented project, educational activities came out of there. You know, they got half a million pounds and they, you know, educate. We, we, we made an educational pack that went into 300 schools in Leeds because the schools would say, the schools agreed we need to teach black history, but they wanted to know what, parts of black history we should teach, so we created a pack. Um, <clears throat> I've mentioned the Windrush sound systems because I'm aware that time's going. I think I've got another slide and that's it. Or is that it? No, that's it. Is that is uh, that it? Or do I have it, another if there's one more, hold on, let me just... Okay, I can't remember because I can't even bring it up because I, like I said, I'm in Barcelona. Oh no, it looks like that's the end. Okay, yeah, okay. Okay, well, um, thanks, Claude. And um, that was a, a whistle that, stop. It was a whistle stop of a, of a fantastic amount of action and activity and celebration, as well as uh, community activism, and particularly your work with uh, young men in. Uh, in Leeds, I think is is very significant. Um, what what we would be doing now is asking Heather to um, perhaps bring up some points, ask some questions, um, and um, follow up some of the points both the two of you have made, Claudia and Claude. And then the, we'll have some time, I hope, before the end of some questions that have come up in discussion. Um, there have been are a couple of questions I've noted. So. Heather, over to you now from the Oral History Society. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Claude, uh, for fascinating, powerful, uh, and in many ways quite poignant um, journeys through your own activism and engagement with campaigns for, for social justice in uh, um, Leeds and in um, Bradford and addressing in all the different ways you have done um, so many different areas of inequalities. Um, so wide ranging. So, and I just want to spell them out again because I have a point to make about it. You people have talked about education, training, policing, community relations, youth work, health, well-being, identity, sense of belonging, what emerges are the interconnections, the interconnections, the underlying roots and causes that perpetuate uh, marginalization, oppression, exclusion. And what you've also both in different, uh, in references to different examples across the 90s, the early 2000s, more recent time, shown how activism, grassroots, has built capacity, solidarity, confidence, and belief that change is, is possible to bring about. And yeah, those are really powerful. So I think the projects that you've sometimes 
detailed, sometimes skimmed over, have such strong stories of personal endeavor from yourselves, but also collective endeavor from who you have reached out to and brought on board to tell those stories, to get involved. Endeavor, overcoming challenges and um, empowerment. So in your own way, the stories I think of your own work um, have been about change making and how you know, both of you uh, for your through the projects that you, you, you've described and been in, involved with over the years are, um, are, are change makers. In the process, I think you have also shown the power of um, power of stories mm -hmm. and the importance uh, of making the work you do and the work you do with people, making those stories available through um, local publications, um, local projects that help to sustain lived experience, that sustain memories and um, cultural expression and the histories and the expertise and the knowledge. I think you've really touched on, well, not just touched upon it, I think you've, you've detailed, you've detailed it. In a way, I think the a question that was put into the chat really early on is really pertinent. Where's the oral history capturing this oral history of, 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 of activism? And you're capturing stories that are adding to the political and the social um, discourse, discussion of Britain's social history, its political history, its campaigning towards social betterment and social justice. The projects you've touched on, you, you've detailed, I think are also highlighting you know, such a powerful narrative about resilience and responding to systematic processes of racism and exclusion and you know marginalization and 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 ignorance so what it brings me to is that the the stories you've shared this evening are Yes, lots of them are. They're still unheard. They're still omitted. They desperately need recording, record keeping, mm -hmm. the story of the projects that capture the experiences. It's a duty, it's an obligation to retain that knowledge, the knowledge of the self-build, the knowledge of the supplementary schools in, in, in Bradford, the knowledge of the, of the cooking. We do need to hold on to them. We need to gather them. We need to celebrate the past in, in, in the present. We need to respect the endeavors of people that have gone before. And we need to inform the future about that. And that process of reclaiming and rectifying overlooked historical presences and is clearly passionate you know, a passion underpins you know, lots of what's been going on what's been talked about tonight uh, it's it's really really powerful so something slightly different that i i just jotted down i just want to see sorry i've got so many papers in front of me but you know after that yeah set of uh, points um what comes across is that the work you're doing is so varied in so many different ways. You're tackling so many different fronts all simultaneously. And I think for people who come from a, an oral history background, from an, 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 an academic interest in, in, in oral history, it's, it's a sole focus or it's a, it's a particular focus. Mm. But the daily bread and butter of your existence, along with 
<laughs> writing funding applications, making sure that you know, you're bringing in an income to 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 pay the rent is is in so many different areas. It's just mind bending that you're dealing with mentoring, you're dealing with mental health, you're getting people on bicycles, you've helped people to build houses, uh, you've run, you know, clubs for disaffected young people, you've brought in homework clubs, you're tackling the police on their, you know, their process of stigmatizing and, yes, and, and criminalizing to the the young it's all going on simultaneously and i think that's a really powerful reminder not just to you the academics who are interested in oral history uh but and the funders and it would be really wonderful if funders were here in this meeting tonight just to hear the 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 struggle really and the context out of which all your all the work from grassroots organizations constantly comes so so there's something about that that um what else these endeavors i think we've all heard this evening are real reminders about valuing how people learn from each other um of recognizing achievements, of inspiring others, of bringing the unheard and the unlistened to and the excluded more into the, the, the picture, of building confidence, of repositioning lived experiences within a broader narrative, whether it's the local narrative, it's the regional narrative, and, and those, or whether it's a national narrative. I think that's been really, really powerful. And it was also really powerful in the, um, the Windrush Generations publication. The interviewees, they recall incidents and events and fragments and inner thoughts and first impressions of what it was like and in their own voices and it has meaning it has meaning now mm -hmm. their private stories have been made public and given significance after being sort of marginalized for such a long time so I think oral histories have come out in, in, in this dialogue, I think about not just giving voices to the unheard, but they invite us so profoundly to question the gaps in the historical record. So, so and rethink and prompt new sorts of questions about the stories that we should be gathering and recording and making sure that this stuff is there as a resource for for the future so i'm going to just stop my yeah <laughs> my own monologue for a while and put put a question um uh, back back to you both really about archiving because saving this stuff is so important you've both generated stuff over years You've mentioned you know, publications, you've mentioned YouTube. Where is it going to be you know, five years from now, 10 years from now? Where's, where's the sustainability plan of safekeeping it for the future? I mean, I'll take this if, first if it's okay. There's not a massive sustainability plan, but our thinking is that it's better to have those stories out of the heads of the people that are giving us the stories and to just at least make a start. Sadly, in, in the north of England, we're not privileged enough to have the levels of funding, you know, that goes in, uh, go into other groups to, to do this type of work. And we've got a 
tradition of um, not just doing it our way, but just doing it on a shoestring. Mm -hmm. So even archiving costs money, you know, making sure that we preserve people's information in the correct way costs money. And I think it's something that we are definitely looking at. But is it is it more important to us than uh, children being excluded? And and that's the question. You know, we can only do so much with so many hours a day. And I think our focus has always been on delivering quality educational services first. And within that comes oral history. So um, for me, I think um, historically, our parents and that generation would, would keep documents, reports under their beds, in their lofts. Um, that's one of the greatest things of um, the internet and, and social media because it gives us a vehicle for hosting stuff. Um, and as well, I'm trying every time now that I do anything to work with the universities because the universities are the biggest storers of archives and stuff. So getting students, getting on, getting on programs like doing programs like this, where individuals are going to record and make that, that information available. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, with, with the internet and social media and that platform, we now have a vehicle where we can put that information, get it out there, and hopefully it will get to more voice, more people will hear about it, read it, look at it. Um, so, yes, yeah, so the times are changing. It's a pity we can't. And, 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 and even people I know, you know, still got some documents and, and we're still trying to find a university group that will take these documents and and digitalize them so that they're they're available for future groups to access. Yeah, I well, think that's yeah. Sorry, Joanne. No, I was just say thank you because uh, well, thank you, Heather, for your um, very passionate response to mm -hmm. Claudia and Claus, and also for that that important question as well, and for. You, you know your two Claudia and Claude's responses. I think we're conscious in the oral history society very much of the uh, struggles which people have to get archives funded. Um, and oh, I've, we've got a hand up here from John Gabriel. Perhaps you'd like to add, add to that, John, and uh, this discussion about archiving. If you can unmute yourself. Oh. What's happened now? Here we go. Hi, yeah, I'm, I'm here. I think I'd probably right. jump the gun uh, with my hand, Joanna. I have got a point, a couple of points, but it's not directly relevant to archiving, except oh, okay. there was one point I did want to say that um, I was actually, I was up in Leeds a couple of weeks ago doing a, a workshop for um, the university PhD students. And, um, the School of History there is very interested in oral history. And um, I think the woman who runs it um, would be very interested if you wanted me to pass on mm. the details of the organization and facilitate a meeting, because it may well be that they could be a repository for their archives or they may facilitate funding for them. So it's just a thought that. I, can I just chip in? I just wanted to say, at a personal note, I, 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 I'm indebted actually to um, the community of Leeds and Leeds Football Club, actually, because um, as an early teenager, I used to watch um, Albert Johansson play uh, for Leeds United, and he was one of the first black footballers, black South African footballers to play in the first division. And um, I... Uh, I was very struck by the level of racism and racist abuse that he got when he was playing uh, for Leeds. And it really made me think as a young teacher, teenager about, you know, what was going on in society. And I was very sad to learn um, that he died I mean, relatively poorly off um, in the mid-1990s after, you know, pretty 
big career in the first division. The the second thing I just wanted to say as well, uh, picking up something Claude said, I was struck by a number of your projects, the range of them, and I think Heather's right. You know, one of the ways in which you join the dots in these experiences of institutions which can be quite fragmented oral history allows you to do that through talking about people's whole life stories and then you get the sense of how education how police how those housing how all those institutional experiences come together in one life so i think it's a great way of documenting the relationship between them but i did think claude you're one of the most powerful and striking stories you told was the one of the um the young men building the houses i'd not heard of that story and um i don't know if you've got any more details about it or links you can send me but i'd be really interested in um reading more about it thank you both very much okay well, I'll, I'll, come, I'll come i'll come back on that um what, what's your name john yeah. um yeah if you if you google claude hendrickson i've got a youtube channel um if you google it and you look in there you'll see frontline self-build um so it, it's there and and if, if you just google claude hendrickson and frontline self-build you'll get a lot of stuff on it because I'm, I'm, I am still peddling and banging the drum for community-led housing and um, land trust. That's why I'm in Barcelona now at this conference talking and, and, and I'm promoting self-build and um, empowerment of people. So yeah, you can, you can Google my name or you can go on to YouTube. Okay, we have, we've got not much time left, but I know there are two questions in, in the chat. Uh, which I don't know whether Claudia, you might have you whether you've seen them or whether you might be interested in responding to them. Um, I'm not quite sure if we're allowed to run over past half past seven, but anyway, um, we we ought to aim to end there. But the first question is about uh, to what extent black children in Yorkshire were. This is from Juanita. Were impacted by ESN schools and also about the immigration legislation on impact of that on the black community and if any activism is formed around these issues that's what that's a kind of double question and then two wanting to know you know what your approach to oral history interviewing is I, I mean that's a lot to to, to to respond to but there might be you know you might want to pick out something there from uh, Juanita's questions I forgot the first one because the, the oh sorry <laughs> there was a lot wasn't it sorry about that it was about the uh about ESN schools and about immigration legislation and what kind of activism formed around those two issues. I think you mentioned something about ESN schooling, didn't you, in your slides? I did. Um, I mean, we've, uh, you know, I can speak from Bradford's perspective. Um, you know, we've always been uh, aware of the issues that affected our children and, and we've been in a constant fight. You know, we've been in a constant struggle to, um, get people to accept you know our our whole existence in this country never mind anything else so we've done a lot of work around um extracurricular activity exclusions and the like over the years and that's really the foundation of the charity and why it started mm. and why we still mm. exist today yeah. when it comes to the second question was that about uh, your approach to oral history yeah what, what what form does it take to do, do for example do you do group interviews or one-to-one -one? i know you showed us a slide which was one-to-one -one yeah video should, yeah uh, group interviews no everybody that we have interviewed so far it's always been on a one-to-one -one basis but mm -hmm. in saying that we do have lots of focus groups and you know this type of thing um mm -hmm. one thing that i've learned tonight is that we're not documenting enough you know we're not mm -hmm you know looking at a way to connect the dots as as was said and mm. I think it's because like I said before you know oral history is probably like 10 percent of what we do mm. can, I, can, can I come in on that yeah yes please. please and I'll do it in reverse when when I did the race card and and when I created the um the media toolkit it was it was very much about there was a platform here how were black people going to use that platform and 
again, black people will go on Facebook, they will go on Instagram, they will go on every other, but instead of using it, and, 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 and that's why we created the toolkit, a media toolkit, so you could see the stages that we've gone through and you could use that platform to um, store information. And, 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 and back to the first question you had said about SEN schools. In Leeds, they had a program where they were gonna create 200 teachers, black teachers that would go into schools. And again, institutional racism within the education system. People signed up for it, went on the training, started to go and work in schools but they were drummed out of the schools. They were made, made to feel insufficient. They were made to leave. A lot of them have left education now and have gone to work in other fields because of the racism they suffered from within the institution of schools. So, you know, um, there has been plans. You know, you know, we even got involved in a black governor's program where we were training black people to become school governors. And they went in, they, they were hounded out by the institutional racism that they suffered from other school governors, you know. So to me, again, there is evidence, there is situations where we have taken it to them, but every time, and I mentioned it institutionally and undermining what we present, these are, I mean, these are all strong and important points. And I think the question that um, Craig, who's had to leave the meeting to go to another meeting, raised, which is about the oral history of activism, the oral history of ACAP, for example, the oral history of, of what you've done, so people can learn from how you approach things, what those issues were, whether they've changed, which it seems in many ways, of course, they haven't. So I, I think if we, if we can, you know, carry on that dialogue outside this meeting and thinking about those things, those are the sort of things I think which the society would be interested in carrying on talking to you about and in any ways which you felt were important and yeah, relevant. Yeah. Well, and can, I think, I, can, I say, can, I, can I say something, Joanna? Yeah. Because we have to wind up mom, soon. I've got to go because we said an hour and a half and it should have I know, finished. Hour. I know. Right. <laughs> no, but you spoke all the time. That's why we spoke. No, 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 Claudia. You said you'd have three slides and you did eight. <laughs> you said can three we, slides. Can, and we, you did can, we leave, can we leave the counting but, behind? But, but, but anyway, <laughs> what I was, was going to say is that. Um, the system, this white system is more likely to give money to white, to you guys to come and do stuff with us than they'll give it to us to, to log our own history. This is, you know, Heather works with the Heritage Lottery. She knows how hard it I... is. <laughs> On, when I say she works with when I say she works with the Heritage Lottery, they've they've school. funded that they yeah. have funded, yeah. but I do think that. Funding has 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 changed, mm. and funders want to be more inclusive. You know, they have to they have to fill their yeah, mandate as well. So I think it is a good time to reach out and and find partners mm. and try and you know, build strong bases for for safeguarding material. So I hear, I, 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 hear, I hear that I hear that, but. If, if I want money to have people dancing up and down in the streets carnival or pretending Windrush by putting on events that are dancing and singing and sport events, they're going to fund them events. They don't fund strong educational things. They give us pittance, but they'll give £50,000 to put on a Windrush dance or a Windrush festival where, you see, it goes back to history where they like to have black people singing and dancing mm -hmm. and going on like we're stupid. When we talk about serious educational stuff that we seriously, they don't want to fund it. And I they say, don't look, want to fund it. Look, well, I need to just want. Do you want to come back on this point, Juanita? And then I think we really got to finish. I know. I'm, yeah, I've got to. I've, I've got to go anyway well, because I, I'm. I'm, I'm <laughs> okay, I just I've got, wanted I've got to. to go.
I've got to go and try and get halfway across well, Barcelona now. Well, I, well, me. well, well, just before you go, Juanita, what were you going to say? And then we'll, we'll finish. I, just just thank you to both Claude and Claudia. And just to say that I completely get where Claude is coming from. I mean, even with this uh, Windrush 75, the funding that's being put forward is being put forward for um, jolly events but anything that's to do with resistance or activism or politics, there's no, it's, it's actually explicitly said, there will be no funding for that. And anybody right. who's applying for that will not get that money. So I, I, I get that there's this kind of people trying to control the narrative, you know, about what the community wants to put across. So I just say, um, I, I really feel what you're saying and, and, and the frustration that's coming through with that. And it's something mm -hmm. I think that's shared as well by the university because we've also wanted to kind of um, focus more on the kind of politics and the activism and the resistance. But again, it's, it's so it's, you're not the only ones in that boat. So just, just mm -hmm. to say that I, I, I really sympathize with you and, and we're in solidarity. And I'll definitely be reaching out to both of you because I, I love the work you're doing. And I think it's fantastic. Really. Mm -hmm. well, that's, yeah. that's, that's great, Juanita. And I think you're speaking for all of us on the Oral, the Oral History Society. So I really, really appreciate okay. both Claudia and Claude, all the effort you put into your presentations tonight, which shows us how much work you've you've done in the past. Mm -hmm. Let's hear more about that. Let's hear, you know, yeah. people talking about the efforts they put into. And thank you, Heather, for your response as well, which was so powerful. Yeah. Um,